19. Left alone, Dolly surveyed the room with a housewife's eye. All she saw when driving up to the house and passing through it, and now in her room, gave her the impression of abundance and elegance, and of that of novel European luxury, which she had read about in English novels, but had never yet seen in Russia in the country. Everything was new, from the new French wallpapers to the carpet which covered the whole floor. The bed had a spring and an overlay mattress, with a specially shaped bolster and small pillows with silk slips. The marble washstand, the dressing table, the couch, the tables, the bronze clock on the mantelpiece, the curtains and door hangings were all costly and new. The smart lady's maid, with hair stylishly done, and wearing a dress more fashionable than Dolly's, who came to offer her services, was as new and expensive as everything else in the room. Dolly found her politeness, tidiness and attention pleasant, but did not feel at ease with her. She was ashamed to let her see the patched dressing jacket, which, as Illach would have it, she had brought by mistake. She was ashamed of the very patches and darns on which she at home prided herself. At home it was clear that six jackets required twenty-four arshins of Nainsuk as sixty-five kopaks, which comes to more than fifteen rubles, besides the trimmings and the work, and she had saved all that. But before the maid, she felt not exactly ashamed, but uncomfortable. Dolly felt much relieved when Anushka, whom she had known a long time, came into the room. The smart maid had to go to her mistress, and Anushka remained with Dolly. Anushka was evidently very pleased that the lady had come, and chattered incessantly. Dolly noticed that she wanted to express her opinion of her mistress's position, and especially of the Count's love of and devotion to Anna, but Dolly carefully stopped her whenever she began to speak about that subject. I grew up with Anna Arkadyevna. She is dearer to me than anything. Is it for us to judge? And how he seems to love? Well then, I have this washed if possible, interrupted Dolly. Yes, ma'am. We have two women always specially kept for washing small things, and the clothes are all done with a machine. The Count goes into everything himself. What a husband! Dolly was glad when Anna came in and thereby put an end to Anushka's chatter. Anna had changed into a very simple lawn dress. Dolly looked carefully at this simple dress. She knew what such simplicity meant and cost. An old acquaintance, said Anna, pointing to Anushka. Anna was now no longer embarrassed. She was free and at her ease. Dolly saw that she had quite got over the impression produced by her arrival, and had adopted a superficial tone of equanimity, which seemed to close the door that led to the compartment where her feelings and intimate thoughts were kept. "'Well, and how's your little girl, Anna?' asked Dolly. "'Annie?' so she called her daughter Anna. "'Quite well. Greatly improved. Would you like to see her? Come, I'll show her to you. "'I've had such trouble with the nurses,' she began. "'We had an Italian wet nurse for her. Good, but so stupid. "'We wanted to send her back, but the child is so used to her that we are still keeping her.' Well, and how have you arranged? Dolly began, meaning to ask what name the little girl would bear. But seeing a sudden frown on Anna's face, she changed the question and said, How have you arranged? Have you already weaned her? But Anna had understood. That is not what you were going to ask. You wish to ask about her name. Am I not right? It troubles Alexis. She has no name. That is, her name is Karenina said Anna, screwing up her eyes till only the meeting lashes could be seen. However, we will talk about all that later, said she, suddenly brightening. Come, I will show it to you. Elle est très gentille, and can crawl already. In the nursery, the luxury noticeable in the rest of the house struck Dolly still more strongly. Here were perambulators ordered from England, an apparatus to teach a baby to walk, a specially constructed piece of furniture like a billiard table for the baby to crawl on, swings and baths of a new special kind. All these were English, strongly made, of good quality, and evidently very expensive. The room was large, very lofty and light. 
When they entered, the little girl was sitting in her chemise in a little armchair at a table, having her dinner of broth, which she was spilling all over her little chest. A Russian nursemaid was feeding the child, and evidently herself eating also. Neither the wet nurse nor the head nurse were to be seen. They were in the next room, where one could hear them talking in a peculiar French, the only tongue in which they could converse. On hearing Anna's voice, a smart, tall Englishwoman, with an unpleasant face and an impure look, came into the room, rapidly shaking her fair curls, and at once began excusing herself, though Anna had not accused her of anything. To each word of Anna's, the Englishwoman quickly repeated, Yes, my lady, several times. The dark-browed, dark-haired, rosy little girl, with her firm, ruddy little body covered with goose flesh, pleased Dolly very much despite the severe expression with which she regarded the new visitor. She even felt a little envious of the child's healthy appearance. The way the little girl crawled also greatly pleased Dolly. Not one of her children had crawled like that. The baby looked wonderfully sweet when she was put down on the carpet, with her little frock tucked up behind. Glancing round at the grown-up people, with her large radiant black eyes, like a little animal, Evidently pleased that she was being admired, she smiled, and turning out her feet, energetically supported herself on her hands, drew her lower limbs forward, and then again advanced her hands. But Dolly did not at all like the general atmosphere of that nursery, especially the English nurse. Only by the fact that a nice woman would not have accepted a post in such an irregular household as Anna's could Dolly explain to herself how Anna, with her knowledge of character, could have engaged for her little girl such an unpleasant and fast Englishwoman. Besides that, from a few words she heard, Dolly at once understood that Anna, the wet nurse, the head nurse, and the baby did not get on with one another, and that the mother's appearance was not a usual occurrence. Anna wished to get the baby her toy and could not find it. But the most astonishing thing was that when asked how many teeth the baby had, Anna made a mistake and knew nothing of the two latest teeth. I feel it hard sometimes that I am, as it were, superfluous here, said Anna on leaving the nursery, lifting her train to avoid the toys that lay beside the door. It was quite different with the first one. I thought, on the contrary, said Dolly timidly. Oh, no. You know I've seen him, Sir Edger, said Anna screwing up her eyes as if peering at something far off. However, we will talk about that afterwards. Would you believe it? I'm just like a starving woman to whom a full meal has been served, and who does not know what to begin on first. The full meal is you, and the talks I'm going to have with you, and which I could not have with anyone else, and I don't know on what to begin first. But I shall not let you off anything. I must speak out about everything. Yes, I must give you a sketch of the people you will meet here, she began. I'll begin with the woman, Princess Barbara. You know her, and I know your and Steva's opinion of her. Steva says the one aim of her life is to prove her superiority to Aunt Catherine Pavlovna. That is quite true, but she is kind and I am very grateful to her. There was a moment in Petersburg when I needed a chaperon. Just then she turned up. Really, she is kind. She made my position much easier. I see you do not realize the difficulty of my position. There in Petersburg, she added. Here I'm quite tranquil and happy. But about that later on. I must continue the list. Then there's Sviatsky. He's a marshal of nobility and a very decent fellow. But he wants something from Alexis. You see, with his means... Now that we have settled in the country, Alexis can have great influence. Then there's Tushkevich. You have met him. He was always with Betsy. Now he's been deposed and has come to us. As Alexis says, he's one of those men who are very agreeable if one takes them for what they wish to appear. And then, he is good form, as the Princess Barbara says. Then there's Veslovsky. You know him. He's a nice boy, she said and a roguish smile puckered her lips. What outrageous affair was that with Levin? Veslovsky told Alexis, and we simply can't believe it. 
Il est très gentil et naïf, she added with the same smile. Men need distraction, and Alexis needs an audience, so I'll value all this company. Things must be lively and amusing here, so that Alexis shall not wish for anything new. Then you will also see our steward. He's a German, very good, and knows his business. Alexis thinks highly of him. Then there's the doctor, a young man, not exactly a nihilist, but, you know, eats with his knife, but a very good doctor. Then there's the architect, un petit cour. 20. Well, here's Dolly for you, princess. You wanted so much to see her, said Anna as she and Dolly came out onto the large stone veranda, where in the shade, before an embroidery frame, the Princess Barbara sat embroidering a cover for an easy chair for Count Vronsky. She says she won't have anything before dinner, but will you order lunch? I'll go and find Alexis and bring them all here. The Princess Barbara received Dolly affectionately, but rather patronizingly, and at once began explaining that she was staying with Anna because she had always loved her more than did her sister Catherine Pavlovna, who had brought Anna up. And that now, when everyone had thrown Anna over, she considered it her duty to help Anna through this transitional and most trying period. Her husband will give her a divorce, and then I shall go back to my solitude. But at present, I can be of use and I fulfill my duty, however hard it may be, not like others. And how kind you are, and how well you have done to come. They live like the best of married couples. It is for God to judge them, not for us. Think of Buryuzovsky and Avanyeva, and even Nikandrov. And how about Vasilyev with Mamonovna, and Liza Naptunova? No one said anything against them. And in the end, they were all received again. And then, it is such a pretty, such a refined home, quite in the English style. We assemble for breakfast and then we separate. Everyone does what he likes till dinner. Dinner's at seven. Steva did very well to send you. He must keep in with them. You know, through his mother and brother he can do anything. And then they do much good. He has not told you about his hospital? It will be admirable. Everything comes from Paris. Their conversation was interrupted by Anna, who had found the men in the billiard room and brought them back with her to the veranda. As there was still plenty of time before dinner, and the weather was beautiful, several different ways of passing the next two hours were proposed. There were a great many ways of spending time at Vozdivschenks, all differing from those at Pokrovsk. Une partie de lawn tennis, suggested Veslovsky with his pleasing smile. We will be partners again, Anna Arkadyevna? No, it's too hot. Better let's walk through the garden and go for a row, to let Daria Alexandrovna see the banks, suggested Vronsky. I will agree to anything, said Sviatsky. I think Dolly will find a walk the pleasantest, won't you? And then we can go in the boat, said Anna. All agreed to this. Vaslovsky and Tuskevich went to the bathing house, promising to get the boat ready there and to wait for the others. Two couples, Anna with Sviatsky and Dolly with Vronsky, walked down a garden path. Dolly was somewhat embarrassed and troubled by the quite novel circle she found herself in. In the abstract, theoretically, she not only executed but even approved of Anna's action. As is frequently the case with irreproachably moral women who become tired of the monotony of a moral life, she, from a distance, not only excused a guilty love, but even envied it. Besides, she loved Anna from her heart. But actually seeing her among these people so alien to herself, with her fashionable tone which was quite new to her, Dolly felt ill at ease. In particular, it was disagreeable to her to see the Princess Barbara, who forgave them everything for the sake of the comforts she enjoyed there. In general, in the abstract, Dolly approved the step Anna had taken, but it was unpleasant to her to see the man for whose sake the step had been taken. Besides, she had never liked Vronsky. She considered him very proud, and saw nothing in him to justify that pride, except his wealth. But involuntarily he, here in his own house, imposed on her more than ever, and she could not feel at ease with him. 
she experienced the same kind of shyness in his presence that she had felt when the lady's maid saw her jacket. As with the maid, she felt not exactly ashamed, but uncomfortable about the patches. So with him, she felt not exactly ashamed, but ill at ease about herself. Feeling embarrassed, she tried to think of something to talk about. Though she thought that, being so proud, he would not be pleased to hear his house and garden admired, yet not finding any other subject for conversation, she said she liked his house very much. Yes, it is a very handsome building and in a good old style, he said. I like the courtyard in front of the portico very much. Was it like that before? Oh no, he replied, and his face lit up with pleasure. If you had only seen that courtyard in spring. And he began, at first with the reserve, but more and more carried away by his subject, to draw her attention to various details of the adornment of the house and garden. One could see that, having devoted great pains to the improvement and decoration of his place, Vronsky felt compelled to boast of them to a fresh person, and was hardly pleased by Dolly's praises. If you care to see the hospital, and are not too tired, it is not far. Shall we go? He suggested, glancing at her face to assure himself that she really was not bored. Will you come, Anna? He said, turning to her. We'll come. Shall we? She asked Sviatsky. But we must not leave poor Vaslovsky and Tuskevich to wait in vain in the boat. We must send to let them know. Yes, it is a monument he is erecting here, said Anna to Dolly, with the same sly, knowing smile with which he had previously spoken about the hospital. Oh, it's a great undertaking, said Sviatsky, but, not to seem to be making up to Vronsky, he immediately added a slightly condemnatory remark. But I am surprised, Count, that you, who are doing so much for the people from a sanitary point of view, should be so indifferent to the schools. Schools have become so common, answered Vronsky. Of course that's not the reason, but I... I've been carried away. This is the way to the hospital, he said, turning to Dolly and pointing to a turning that led out of the avenue. The ladies opened their sunshades and entered the sidewalk. After several turnings they passed through a gate, and Dolly saw on the high ground before her a large red, nearly completed building of a fanciful shape. The still unpainted iron roof shone dazzlingly in the sunshine. Beside the finished building, another as yet surrounded by scaffolding, was being built. Workmen wearing aprons stood on the scaffolding laying bricks, pouring water from wooden pails or smoothing the mortar. How quickly your work gets on, says Fiatchki. When I was last here there was no roof. It will be finished by autumn. The interior is nearly completed, said Anna. And what is this new building? That will be the doctor's quarters and the dispensary, replied Vronsky. And seeing the architect in a short jacket, coming toward them, he apologized to the ladies and went to meet him. Avoiding the pit from which the men were taking mortar, he stopped and began heatedly discussing something with the architect. The pediment is still too low, he answered Anna's question as to what it was all about. I said the foundations ought to be raised, said Anna. Yes, of course that would have been better, Anna Arkadyevna, replied the architect, but it's done now. Yes, I am very much interested in it, said Anna to Sviatsky, who expressed surprise at her knowledge of architecture. The new building ought to be in line with the hospital, but it was an afterthought and was begun without a plan. Having finished talking with the architect, Vronsky rejoined the ladies and led them to the hospital. Although they were still working at the cornices outside and painting inside on the ground floor, the upper story was nearly finished. Ascending the broad cast iron staircase to the landing, they entered the first large room. The walls were plastered with imitation marble and the enormous plate glass windows were already in place. Only the parquet floor is not finished, and the carpenters who were planing a square of the parquet left their work, and removing the tapes that kept their hair out of the way, bowed to the gentlefolk. This is the waiting room, said Vronsky. There will be a desk, a table, and a cupboard here. Nothing more. This way, we will pass here. 
Don't go near the window, said Anna, feeling whether the paint was dry. Alexis, the paint is dry already, she added. From the waiting room they passed into the corridor. Here Vronsky showed them the new system of ventilation, which had been installed. Then he showed the marble baths and the beds with peculiar spring mattresses. Then he took him to one ward after another, to the storeroom, the linen room, showed the stoves built on a new plan, then some silent trolleys to convey necessary articles, and much besides. Svyachki appreciated everything, like one who was acquainted with all the newest improvements. Dolly was simply surprised at what she had never before seen, and wishing to understand it all, asked for information about every detail, which evidently gratified Vronsky. Yes, I think this will be the only quite correctly planned hospital in Russia, said Sviatchki. And will you have a maternity ward? inquired Dolly. There is so much wanted in the country. I often... Despite his courtesy, Vronsky interrupted her. This is not a maternity home, but a hospital, and is intended for all illnesses, except infectious ones, he said. But have a look at this, and he moved a chair for convalescence, just arrived from abroad toward Dolly. Just look. He sat down in the chair and began moving it. A patient is unable to walk, still too weak or has something the matter with his feet, but he wants fresh air, so he goes out, takes a ride. Everything interested Dolly, and everything pleased her, especially Vronsky himself with his natural and naive enthusiasm. Yes, he is a very nice good fellow, she thought again and again not listening to him, but looking at him, understanding his expression, and mentally putting herself in Anna's place. In this animated state, she liked him so much that she understood Anna's being able to fall in love with him. 21. No, I think the Princess Daria Alexandrovna is tired, and horses do not interest her, said Vronsky to Anna, who was suggesting that they should go to the stud farm, where Sviatchki wanted to look at a new stallion. You go, and I will see the princess back to the house and we'll have a talk with her. If you do not mind, he added, turning to Dolly. I don't understand anything about horses, and shall be very pleased to, answered Dolly, taken rather by surprise. She saw by Vronsky's face that he wanted something of her. She was not mistaken. As soon as they had passed through the gate back into the garden, he glanced in the direction Anna had taken, and having assured himself that she could not hear or see them, he began. You've guessed that I want to talk to you, he said, looking at her with laughter in his eyes. I know that you are a friend of Anna's. He took off his hat and with his handkerchief mopped his hat, which was getting bald. Dolly did not reply and only looked at him with alarm. Alone with him, she suddenly felt frightened. His laughing eyes and stern expression scared her. Many diverse suppositions as to what he was about to say, flitted through her brain. He will ask me to come and stay with him, and bring the children, and I shall have to refuse. Or to get together a circle for Anna in Moscow. Or maybe it's about Vazenka Vazlovsky and his relations with Anna. Or possibly about Kitty, and that he feels guilty toward her. Everything she surmised was unpleasant, but she did not hit on what he actually wished to speak about. You have so much influence over Anna, and she's so fond of you, he said. Help me. Dolly looked with timid inquiry at his energetic face, which was now wholly and now partly in the sunlight that fell between the lime trees, and then was again darkened by their shadow. She waited for what more he would say. But he walked by her side in silence, prodding the gravel with his stick as he went. As you have come to see us, and you are the only one of Anna's former friends who has. I do not count the Princess Barbara. I feel you have done so not because you consider our position normal, but because, realizing all the hardship of that position, you love her as before and wish to help her. Have I understood you rightly? He asked, turning toward her. Ah, oh, yes, answered Dolly, closing her sunshade. But... No, he interrupted and forgetting that he was placing his companion in an awkward position, he stopped, so that she was obliged to stop also. 
No one feels all the hardship of honest position more than I do. And that is naturally so, if you do me the honour of regarding me as a man with a heart. I am the cause of that position, and therefore I feel it. I understand, said Dolly, involuntarily admiring him for the frank and firm way in which he said it. But just because you feel you've caused it, I'm afraid you exaggerate it, she said. I understand that her position in society is a hard one. In society it is hell, he said quickly with a dark frown. It is impossible to imagine greater moral torments than those she endured for two weeks in Petersburg. I beg you to believe me. Yes, but here, so long as neither Anna nor you feel that you need society. Society, he exclaimed with contempt. What need can I have of society? Till then, and that may be always, you are happy and tranquil. I see that Anna is happy, quite happy. She has already told me so, said Dolly, smiling. And involuntarily, while saying it, she doubted whether Anna was really happy. But Vronsky, it seemed, did not doubt it. Yes, yes, he said. I know that she has revived after all her suffering. She is happy. She is happy in the present. But I? I am afraid of what is before us. I beg your pardon. You want to move on? No, I don't mind. Well then, let us sit down here. Dolly sat down on a seat at the turn of the avenue. He stood before her. I see she's happy, he repeated, and the doubt as to whether Anna was really happy struck Dolly yet more strongly. But can it continue? Whether we acted rightly or wrongly is another question. The die is cast, he said, changing from Russian into French. And we are bound together for life. We are united by what are for us the holiest bonds of love. We have a child. We may have other children. Yet the law and the circumstances of our position are such that thousands of complications appear which at present, while resting after all her sufferings and trials, she neither sees nor wishes to see. That is natural. But I cannot help seeing them. My daughter is not mine by law, but Karanin's. I hate this falsehood, he said with an energetic gesture of denial. I looked at Dolly with a gloomily questioning expression. She made no answer, but only looked at him. He continued. Some day a son may be born, my son, and he will by law be a Karanin, and not heir either to my name or my property. And however happy we may be in our family life, and whatever children we may have, there will be no legal bond between them and me. They will be Karanins. Imagine the hardship and horror of this situation. I have tried to speak to Anna about it, but it irritates her. She does not understand, and I cannot speak out about it to her. Now look at the other side of it. I am happy, happy in her love, but I need an occupation. I have found one. I am proud of it, and consider it more honourable than the occupation of my former comrades at court or in the service. I certainly would not exchange my work for theirs. I am working here, remaining on the spot, and I am happy and contented, and we need nothing more for our happiness. I like my activities. It is not a last shift. On the contrary. Dolly observed that at this point his explanation was confused, and she could not quite understand why he had wandered from the point, but she felt that having once begun to speak of his intimate affairs, of which he could not speak to Anna, he was now telling her everything and that the question of his work in the country belonged to the same category of intimate thoughts as the question of his relations with Anna. Well, to continue, he said, recovering himself, the principal thing is that when working, I want the assurance that the work will not die with me, that I shall have heirs, and that I have not got. Imagine the situation of a man who knows in advance that children born of him and of the woman he loves will not be his but someone else's, someone who will hate them and will have nothing to do with them. You know it is dreadful. He paused, evidently greatly excited. Yes, of course, I quite understand. But what can Anna do? asked Dolly. Well, this brings me to the point of my talk, he went on, calming himself with an effort. Anna can do it. It depends on her. 
even to be able to petition the emperor for permission to adopt a child. A divorce will be necessary, and that depends on Anna. Her husband was willing to have a divorce. Your husband had almost arranged it, and I know he would not refuse now. It is only necessary to write to him. He then replied definitely that if she expressed the wish, he would not refuse. Of course, he said gloomily, that is one of those pharisaic cruelties of which only heartless people are capable. He knows what torture every recollection of him causes her, and knowing her, he still demands a letter from her. I understand that it is painful for her, but the reasons are so important that one, one, must, one must get over all these refinements of sentiment. The happiness and existence of Anna and her children depend on it. I do not speak of myself, though it is very hard on me, very hard, he said with a look as if he were menacing someone for making it so hard on him. And so, princess, I shamelessly cling to you as an anchor of salvation. Help me to persuade her to write to him and demand a divorce. Yes, certainly, said Dolly thoughtfully, vividly remembering her last conversation with Karenin. Yes, certainly, she repeated resolutely, remembering Anna. Use your influence with her. Get her to write. I don't wish, and I'm almost unable to speak to her about it. Very well, I will speak to her. But how is it she herself does not think of it? asked Dolly, suddenly remembering that strange new habit Anna had of screwing up her eyes. And she remembered that it was just when the intimate side of life was in question that Anna screwed up her eyes. As if she were blinking at her life so as not to see it all, thought Dolly. Certainly I will speak to her, for my own sake and for hers, she said in reply to his expression of gratitude. They got up and went back to the house.